Welcome to the Daily's Double Shot. I'm Kylie Walchuk. And I'm Morgan Garg. Coming up on this week's show, we have a behind-the-scenes look at last weekend's ESPN's game day taping. And then we'll follow Willie Denman and his cohorts as they try and find the best burrito on the Ave. Reporter Kim Spaulding asks UW students how they feel about Olympia's proposal to tax candy on this week's Kim on the Street. And Laura O'Neill Dunn hosts a panel of students as they discuss the merits of Black History Month. Then play guy or gal as reporter Christy Hamilton reports on last week's drag show held in Kane Hall. All coming up on the Daily's Double Shot. UW hosted ESPN's game day last weekend as they taped their show last Saturday morning at Heck Edmondson Pavilion. We have a behind the scenes look at what went down. We've been coming out here for 48 hours. Hour, Hour 32. 32 right now. We have a lot of sign making left to do. Yeah, we do. For we better show up with this decibel meter. The franchise that used to be here is not too heard of them. <laughs> Blow out, you know. Blow out. Woo! Hell good sign oh. by Zareen. This is, this is what the country looks like to ESPN. <laughs> and it, it may or may not be missing about, oh, I don't know, the entire West Coast. Yeah! Here we go! We love ESPN! Woo! College game day! I just got called down. I think they picked the best fan out of there. Um, somebody said my name, come down, and I came on down. Just trying to stay calm, focus on the rim, and let it go. Watch it, watch it, 
Next, we have Willie Denman in an ongoing search to find the best food on the AB. This week, who's got the best burrito? Hi, I'm Willie Denman, and we're here on the AB continuing our quest for the best of. Today, we're in search of what else but the best burrito. My first stop, Taco Del Mar, located on 42nd Street. With a weekend special, one Mondo burrito costs just $3.99. Next, I travel north less than a block to Chipotle. Here, a normal burrito runs you $5.70. To round out my search, I made a stop at one of UW's favorite late night destinations. At Memo's, a chicken asado burrito goes for $4.50. With the three amigos in hand, it was time for battle burrito to begin. I realized alone my objectivity was in question. To solve this problem, I sought out the help of two Tex-Mex aficionados. Alright, so now that we've divided each burrito into thirds here, I'm joined with my guest panel. Laura O'Neill Ben. And Tarek Walmsley. And we're going to go one by one and grade each burrito for how, how much we like it, how much we enjoy eating it. Um, do you guys have any initial thoughts on each burrito? Yeah, this one looks bomb. Like, it's all overflowing. Yeah, I'm yeah. excited to eat this one. <laughs> yeah, this one's, really, this one's really thick. This one has a lot of sauce that's coming out. So I feel like, yeah, I feel like the tortilla looks kind of dry, but there's like a lot of sauce. This one has guacamole. I don't know how to feel about that. I love guacamole. I hate guacamole. But so I'm this one over here is our dark horse. Power thing. through it. Kind of just... Just yeah, we don't know about that. Should we start with that one, the mystery one? Yeah. Sounds good to me. Sounds right. looks like your basic. Start on number one. Yeah. Okay, go. Oh, I was supposed to stick in the middle, wasn't Yeah, you cheated. All right. <laughs> All right. Mmm, mm. good. Okay. Mm. How do I feel about this? What do you guys think about the tortilla? I think the tortilla is really nice. That's nice moist. Yeah, from the, moist. from the stuff inside, but still holding the burrito together. I really like this. The best part about this one is definitely the salsa, I would say. The tortilla like sticks to the back of your teeth? Mm. Mm. I like your that mouth. though. That's you like that? I mean, I don't like that, but that means it's a good tortilla. So we're finished up here with number one, and uh, we like the tortilla. It was nice and moist, but the rice and beans are kind of, kind of the mainstay. There wasn't much else, so move on to two and see how we feel about that. If you guys want to... You get Go the middle piece this time. That's right. you. That's me. I'm taking middle. this one. Mm, mm, that's so good. Definitely an improvement. That's really good. That the meat, chicken is like the meat's really good. It's got the like grill. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's really smoky, right? Wow. Mm. Bite two. How do you feel about the? Is the tortilla sticking to the back of your teeth? No. Oh, okay. It's not. No complaints. No. It's a different kind of tortilla. It looks like someone made this tortilla with love. But it's still, it's still really moist. So it's a win-win. So. Definitely a lot more ingredients to this one, right? Yeah, that different vegetables. The, this first one was really simple, but this one's kind of a lot of stuff incorporated. Mm -hmm. um, we'll have to see what the price is when we get to the end, but this was definitely a bigger <laughs> burrito. Important, right? Yeah, definitely. And the first one just tasted kind of, I don't know, more more processed even. Like this one just tastes like came from someone's home. Mm -hmm. So all in all, number two was, it was a really good burrito. We liked, uh, all the elements that went into it, we thought there was, a lot, there was a lot of flavors, a lot of different, uh, the rice was different, the beans and the, the cilantro really added a lot to it. So, really like number two. We're gonna move on to number three now. Um, you guys wanna go for it. Andrew, All right. thank you, I'm sorry. This one. Oh, wow, Holy okay. crap, that doesn't even. This one's, a, like, this one's more of a heart attack burrito. That doesn't even look good, Looks dude. like there's a lot of. Don't judge, it, don't judge it before you eat it. Mmm, awesome. salty. Um, yeah. I don't, yeah. I don't like this. You don't like it? Uh -uh. Doesn't it seem like it could be like old rotten meat that they like made really salty so that you can't <laughs> taste that it's rotten? That's not you know, like pickled, like something That's pickled. That's not what That's I like, like to discuss when I'm actually eating it, but I suppose <laughs> that I can see your point. I don't like the chicken, it's too salty. Um, por que no hay arroz en este burrito? No sé, no mm. lo sé. I don't know, there's not a whole lot you can say. There's the chicken, a little bit of guacamole, a little bit of tomatoes, a lot of salt. All right, so now that we're through consuming or tasting each one individually, we're gonna write down our favorites on these pad and paper, so I'll give you guys each a little sheet. You guys ready for the reveal? Let's do it. All right. Yeah, um, oh. This is lame. <laughs> Why'd you choose number right. two? Number two, um, there's just like so much stuff in it. There's like a bunch of salsa, rice, but not too much. Really good chicken, 
grilled really well. Mm -hmm. um, black beans, really good tortilla, huge burrito. Yeah. Sour cream. How about you? Isn't it yeah. the same thing? I agree. And it, just, it tasted so fresh. And even though it's white rice, which I wouldn't normally say would be the best, there's a ton of cilantro in the rice. Chicken yeah, I think delicious. The, the rice was like mixed with the cilantro and the, those, those it's like seasonings, so it tasted really good. And... Okay, so now that we're done eating, you guys want to know where each one is from? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, number one is from Taco Del Mar. Number two is from Chipotle. What? And number three <laughs> what? is from Memos. <sighs> that makes sense. All right, so today in Battle Burrito, massive corporation Chipotle reigns supreme, for better or for worse. Thanks for watching and. Back to you, Kylie and Morgan. State legislators are debating removing candy and gum from the list of tax-exempt food products in Washington. In this week's Kim on the Street, reporter Kim Spaulding asks UW students how they feel about having to pay an extra 10% to satisfy their sweet tooth. Governor Gregoire has proposed the idea of putting tax on non-necessary food items like candy, soda, and bottled water. We're going to see what the students at UW think about this upcoming tax proposal. About how much candy or soda and stuff do you drink, eat per week? Uh, probably like 30 sodas, 10 bags of candy. I go through a bag, one of the jumbo bag of M&M's a week. A lot. <laughs> Definitely dark chocolate every night. So about how much candy or soda do you consume each week, would you say? I don't consume, well, actually. Depends on if I have any candy. Is it finals week or like regular? <laughs> I guess it depends how stressed I am. Definitely more during finals week. I have like probably about four sodas every day. Diet Coke is like water to me. <laughs> I don't drink soda. As far as candy, very little. I don't really drink soda ever, but I have chocolate most days, yeah. I don't consume any soda, but candy, um, not that much candy. Basically the idea is that there would be a sales tax on candy, soda, bottled water, and things like that. So how do you guys feel about that? Um, I don't know, considering what's going on, like especially here at UW with the budgets being cut, I don't think it would be ex like too bad of a thing as long as it's not like high taxing. I feel like that's a terrible idea. I'm all for the increase in taxes on soda and bottled water, but leave my candy alone, please. <laughs> I don't know, I'd prefer if Gregoire kept her mitts out of my candy consumption. Well, I'm against taxes. They are evil and bad. Candy tax sounds stupid. Everything's already a, a little expensive here, and so I could I think it's a bad idea. But then it's all probably good, so people won't buy candy. But it could be a good source of revenue. I agree. <laughs> yeah, I would be in support of it, kind of like other sin taxes, like with cigarettes and alcohol. I think it's a really good idea. Yeah, I think it's a great idea because the whole reason they're not taxed is because they're considered food, and food isn't taxed because it's a necessity. But these are things that are absolutely luxury. We eat a lot of like sugar, a lot of people have sodas and candy, and maybe they'll help people not have as much sugar in their lives. That might be a neat idea in the sense that like it makes you think whether or not you should be buying candy and soda, like just another incentive not to. It could either break people's candy and soda habits or it could, those people that are stuck on those habits could help fund the economy in some ways. No, personally I don't understand the bottled water one. Just. I mean, water's not bad for you. Well, it sounds like quite a few UW students are big candy and soda consumers, so maybe this tax will raise a little bit of money that could maybe help us. Who knows? Reporting for The Daily's Double Shot, this is Kimberly Spaulding. February is Black History Month, and in this week's episode of The Good, The Bad, and The Rad, Laura Neal Dunn talks to a group of students about the importance of this month's message and its relevance in today's political climate. Hello, everyone, and welcome to The Good, The Bad, and The Rad. As February comes to a close, this week we're talking Black History Month. Here to help me out, we have Piper, a junior pursuing a degree in drama, Daniel Choi, a senior studying English, physiology, and diversity studies, and Janelle Brown, a junior education major and president of Black Student Union. Thanks so much to everybody for coming on the show today. Thank you for having me. Glad to be here. A lot has changed since Black History Month was first celebrated. Do you guys think that this month still serves its purpose, or would you like to see it doing more? Do you think that Black History Month in its current incarnation is good, bad, or rad? I would say that Black History Month in its current form is good. I think at one time it was rad because its initial reason for it being was because black history was being left out of like history discussions and textbooks and education. Do you guys agree? Yeah, I mean, I think there are good parts to it. It's, under it's important to understand your history and understand the history of America and slavery and how it affects today. Well, it just depends on what history we're actually studying. 
um, in American traditions, history textbooks, and so on, we get a bunch of half-truths, um, and we don't have the whole story. Um, we still have everybody thinking Abraham Lincoln freed the slaves, and that, that exactly is not what happened. And so that's bad. And if we're going to continue to perpetuate a month of just, hey, let's continue what we already know, that's, that's, it's not necessary anymore. If we're going to continue this black history movement, true history and full history is necessary. The good, the bad, and the rat, all of it. You usually get the, in history, you know, the winners tell the story because mm -hmm. either people died or in wars they were killed. So that's why Howard Zinn, you know, the mm -hmm. people's history took the stories of and the non-winners. Yeah, yeah, and throw them in there Tukaki too. and all of these all historians who took time to actually examine Rest in peace. the not right to both of them. <laughs> um, they took the time to not portray just the winner side of history. Yeah. So it is very important that you portray all angles. I'm going to point out that the winner side is the white side of history. Hey, what you said, go ahead and preach and, that. And, 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 <laughs> and, let's keep it once here, right Let's here. just keep it here, right here. We got, we got three <laughs> non-white people, right. and we got five people in the studio that are all <laughs> White, 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 white. Running the camera. <laughs> <laughs> oh, on that note, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move on, but we're, it's, it's still going on the same theme because <laughs> what I have here is that um, according to the Office of the Registrar here at UW, only 3.1% of the students at UW are black. So, and that's, I mean, it's not a lot, and compared with the population of Seattle, which is only 10% black, it's still, you know, it's, it's lower. Um, so, in response to that, someone last year named Lul Mangesha published a book called The Only Black Student, and it was about his experience at UW. So does the title of that book resonate with you? And do you think that calling attention to it with a book or with pointing out everyone in our studio is good, bad, or rad? Oh, I definitely think calling attention to it with a book is rad. I think the whole idea is rad. I haven't read the book yet, but I, I, I hope to. But um, yeah, I've read an article about it. We talked about it in my education class. And I think that's a rad idea just because it is something that not a lot of people that aren't of color don't understand. I mean, who's to say White that they're going to pick it up and read and read that <laughs> book? I mean, who's to say they are? But it's glad that that information's out there. Yeah, I think you should always let it be known. You know, that's why I speak out on issues. And you know, that's also why I came on the show. I mean, I'm not a black, so I don't really know, like, oh, it's <laughs> the only black person on campus. But I mean, I do understand that the problem of racism still exists. I think it's rad that he can go out and publish this book, dedicate his time, and you know, let people know his experience, because I think that's important. Lowell's rad. The book is rad. You know, everything about <laughs> it is like, Lowell, I, Lowell that's a, he's a real cool cat. Like, Lowell is a really good guy. Um, the book, I love the book personally. Uh, just like he said, this book is for, yes, the black students who can, you know, resonate with it and say, yes, we feel like this. But the white kids need to read it too. It's not just about, you know, the Asian kids and the Pacific Islanders and Latinos. Everybody needs to read this book because at some point in the book, everybody can resonate. You're going to find yourself in that book. And some people may find themselves on the other side of it. They may not like where they find themselves in it, but they will. I'm an English major. You're an English major. Um, I don't really know how it goes on other classes, but I'm sure that you guys have experiences. You're in a class and you're reading, you know, I don't know, a poem. Uh, it could be an article. It could be anything. It features the N-word. And, you know, maybe we're reading out loud. Maybe we have to discuss it. Everyone in the class has to make their own choice. Say it or not say it. What do you guys choose to do? What have you experienced in other classes that you've been in? And do you think that the choices that people around you are making or that you are making are good, bad, or rad? If you are reading a poem, a book, you're in eighth grade, you're reading Huck Finn, whatever, read it and treat it as the text, as the word. Like, I don't like when people are like, and this happened a lot in high school with like a book and we'll be reading it and it's like, and nigger, oh. <laughs> and like looking at me like, oh. Like, I'm like okay? black student effect because yeah, you're yeah, that yeah. one black kid. You're so the one black kid. When they say it, everybody, um, or they'll be like, and so then the went on to like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I mean, saying? like you're giving you're giving that word power. It's how it's being used. And if it's in a book and you're reading the word, just treat it like another word. Which I think it's wild. important to understand what the word means. It's a definition. It's like, and where does that power come from? You know, it's like if we if we didn't have a society that was based on racism and white supremacy. I mean, you could say chink to me, and you'd be like, oh, that's cool, whatever, it doesn't matter, but it's only because of what these words mean. It's like, what does the N-word mean? It means that you're a victim of racism because you're black, you know, and you're not white. It's like, what does chink mean? It's like, you're a victim of racism and white supremacy because you're Asian and not white. It's okay, like, well, I have a question then, because then, from my perspective, like, I, I want to treat it as just a word. I don't want to give the word power, but I also, there's the other feeling that I don't want to risk offending anybody. So what, what should I do in that situation? I mean, you have to understand that as a white person, like, you're already in a position that, that is pretty offensive to non-white people. 
I don't know what to tell you as a white person to be like, this is what you do. It's like, I feel like that's like asking for approval again. It's like, I don't, I don't know what the answer is, but I do know racism is a problem. <laughs> we, gotta, we gotta focus on this. Okay, I wanna, I wanna kind of bring it back to Black History Month at the UW. And um, I found this daily article from 1999, and it was called, Athletes of Color Paint a Portrait of All Minority Students. And in this article, there was a, a black athlete quoted as saying, a few people make assumptions. Oh, you must play football or basketball. Have you guys experienced or noticed this, and do you think it's different now than it was maybe in 1999 when the article was published and Good, Bad, or Red? It's not different. It's not different. It's not different at all, and it's bad. It's, it's not different. It's totally it, bad. It's bad, yeah. and it's not different, but like at the same time, I don't have people coming up to me being like, are you an athlete? Because obviously I don't look like an athlete, you know, like, but it's bad. It's bad. There's yeah. no good. It's bad, but the thing is, like, I'll run into, like, if I interact with a football player or something, they'll be like, Oh, oh, you automatically assume I'm a football player. I'm like, yeah, you're six foot five and you have a shirt that says Washington football on it. Stop acting so offended. It is a problem when people think that the only black students on campus are athletes. Stereotypes are really bad in education mm -hmm. for black people. It's one of the main hindrances because if you're not an athlete in higher ed, then you're acting white for actually pursuing higher education. It's like getting education has been racially codified. Exactly. Yeah. And, and then again, of course, the history. There's a long history of battles and struggles within education for black people, yeah. for people of color as a whole. There was a uh, college party at UC San Diego, and uh, the party was called Compton Cookout, I believe. And it was a, uh, a party mocking Black History Month, perhaps occurring over the Martin Luther King Day long weekend. Um, what do you guys think about this? That is all bad, all bad, like terrible. There's these people that uh, they think it's funny to be inappropriate. Like, oh yeah, this is so inappropriate. This is so wrong that they're getting dressed and doing it. Oh my God, we're putting on black makeup. This is so bad. It's gonna be so funny. They, they have think black it's blackface for real. Yeah. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. They thought it was funny. They thought yeah. it was funny. I didn't know. They still do. That. Do you think that the, the idea Thunder, there? Blackface, like. Yeah, that's true. Here, do you so. think the yeah, idea there is like that? Yeah. It's, yeah. That is like some people think that we, you know, they're so out of touch that they think we are in like a real post-racial America, and therefore it's okay. Or do you think that they are so behind that they don't even recognize I, that it's not okay? No, I think they realize that it's not okay, they but know, they, they think know. it's funny. Like yeah, that's the, that's what it. that's what comedians and stuff do. They 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 push at what's not okay. That's the funniest comedians are the people like Dave Chappelle, the people that push the envelope, that go where most people will say, that's not where you should be talking yeah, about. And they go there Comedians and make you laugh at racism, but like that is not funny, you know? It's like, we should not be laughing at these things, you know? This is not entertainment. Like, these are people's lives. Just like, to play devil's advocate, know. I guess. What if we think of it as comedy giving, you know, it's like, just like, that's what the, you know, blues impulse is. It's, you know, like the whole blues impulse, the idea of blues, that comedy falls under the blues impulse. There's actually a documentary, Why We Laugh. It's like talking about the history of black comedy and utilizing these things that are negative. So basically the laugh to keep from crying mentality. Mm -hmm. It's like, we give humor to this and we laugh at it and we poke fun at all this racial, mm -hmm. racialization because mm -hmm. really, we understand this is ridiculous. This is dumb. So we're just gonna laugh at it. That's about all the time that we have. Thank you so much everyone for coming on the show today. We hope to see you all next time on The Good, The Bad, and The Rad. UW's annual drag show was held last week in Kane Hall. Here's reporter Christy Hamilton with a look at the wild festivities. This year is the eighth annual drag competition, so it's become a tradition. I'm expecting to fill Kane 130 with, um, I think it holds 720 people. Um, I'm hoping I don't have to turn too many people away, but if you go by what Facebook says, then more than that are going to show up. So I think it's gonna be a really good success. I had never done drag before. I was approached by Maggie Capwell, who asked me if I was interested in doing the drag show. On a whole, I think that the UW community is really strong for it. Every year, this is a packed house. Like, there's not an empty seat if you don't show up. By the time doors open, you're not getting in. Drag comes in many different forms, more than just a man dressing as a woman. Drag, I would say, is an opportunity to explore the the other side of your gender. Oh, girl, I've done drag. It's playing with gender roles, playing with identity, playing with who you see yourself as. Well, my friend who does it describes it as a way for him to get his femme out so he can kind of seem normal and butch. I thought the message was really good. And got to bring my mom to one of these things. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> okay.
you know, we live outside with all the social constructs of you need to be masculine, you need to be feminine. It's an opportunity to get out there and do whatever the hell you want. I'm not trying to look like a woman. I'm not trying to be a woman. I am in drag. It's different. It's, it's loud, it's obnoxious, it's flamboyant, it's over the top, it's ridiculous. It's something that a normal girl would not wear walking down the street. I think one of the biggest things that I hear is that it's all about attention whoring and shock value. On one hand, I can see why people say that, you know, it, because it does elicit a shock response. And it does make people sit up and go, what the hell is going on in here? Really, I think that the idea is more to make a point to have a voice and to say something. We want to get the notion out there that the gender norms that we've been told are correct are not actually as black and white. What you can expect from tonight is kind of a, an acoustic into something of a, a semi-opera. It's going to be really exciting. I'm really stoked on it. It was inspired from Gaga's own tours and, and what she does when she's on tour, watching countless videos of what she does live and trying to reenact that tonight. I was on study abroad and I went to a gay bar down in um, Salvador, which is in the northeast of Brazil, and somebody in line stopped me and recognized me from, the, from last year's performance on YouTube in Brazil. How crazy is that? So I was really stoked that that video made it halfway across our hemisphere, you know, that's really cool. Drag queens as a community really want to be eliciting that conversation out of their audience, really want to get people starting talking about it you know, from the second they walk in the door to when they walk out the door. Like, what exactly did we see? How are we going to carry this into our actual lives? I think that's one of the best parts about a drag performance is when you realize that you've touched somebody's core values in that way. And that is it for this week's Double Shot. Thanks for joining us, Huskies. Be sure to join us next week for the Daily's Double Shot.